For our last video from chapter eight, we're going to explain two of the failures of valence bond theory, that it doesn't explain resonance or paramagnetism, a term we'll define here shortly. What does explain those two phenomena is something that's known as molecular orbital theory, or MO theory. And what kind of sets the ground for this thought is the Lewis structure of diatomic oxygen, O2, okay, which is shown on the bottom of this slide. It's exactly how you would draw the Lewis structure for O2. And we see that all the electrons are paired up, either in bonds or in lone pairs. Yet, experimentally, diatomic oxygen is attracted to a magnetic field, which only sh happens if it has unpaired electrons. Okay? So it's been determined experimentally that oxygen has unpaired electrons, but valence bond theory and these Lewis structures don't explain that. Okay? So some key terms moving forward to. Okay? Oxygen is paramagnetic. It's attracted to a magnetic field. Something that's not attracted to a magnetic field or weakly repels a magnetic field is diamagnetic. And those are two terms from this video that you definitely want to know, paramagnetic and diamagnetic. Okay. Keeping in mind that neither of them are acting as magnets, they're just responding to an applied external magnetic field. Okay. So what MO theory does to explain the magnetism, the paramagnetism of oxygen? Okay is it uses atomic orbitals still, combines them together, kind of like hybridization, except instead of producing hybridized atomic orbitals that are unique to individual atoms, we yield new molecular orbitals that belong to the entire molecule. So the electrons are kind of delocalized throughout the entire molecule. So that makes more sense why we can do things like violate the octet rule, because those electrons can be in more places. So this next slide 58 gives us a nice comparison of valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory. Okay. We've just talked about the first point. The second point, right, valence bond theory does hybrid orbitals, right, MO theory does atomic orbitals, and as we'll see shortly, those are called sigma, sigma star, pi, and pi star molecular orbitals. Okay. Valence bond theory gives us sigma and pi bonds, MO theory describes things as being as either bonding or anti-bonding interactions. Okay? When we put in electrons, they either help form a bond or take away from a bond. Valence bond theory is really good at predicting shape. MO theory is better at predicting where the electrons are, which is why VB theory does not adequately describe resonance and needs multiple structures, but MO theory can do it in one diagram. So what we're doing in this new combination of orbitals right, is similar to what we talked about in chapter six in the early part of chapter eight. Right? It's a continuation of quantum mechanics. We're using regions of probability of our electrons. Those are described by wave functions and, and electrons are relegated to those specific discrete energy levels, right? They're quantized. Those were called molecular orbitals. And now, just like atomic orbitals, we're just thinking about the same thing being a whole molecule, okay? It's pretty much all the same, except now just doing it, we're, we were previously doing it for an atom, now we're doing it for a whole molecule, okay? All the other rules still hold. We still fill from the lowest energy up, the alfalfa principle, right? Every molecular orbital can still only hold two electrons and they have to have opposite spins continuation of the ideas from before. Okay. It's still called linear combination of atomic orbitals, which we saw in video two here for chapter eight. All right. So we're going to start with MO theory by considering homonuclear diatomic molecules. Diatomic meaning two atoms, homonuclear meaning that they're the same atom. And when we have two atoms coming together to form a molecule, there's two possibilities okay, for how those atoms join one another. They can do it in phase with one another, okay? And that's called constructive interference. Or they can come together out of phase of one another. That's called destructive interference. Okay? And depending on how that works, it'll either contribute to bonding or take away from bonding. When those two MOs 
overlap one another. Okay? If they're in phase, that's known as a bonding orbital, okay? also known as a sigma molecular orbital. Okay? Bonding orbital, which is where we want the, we have the electrons where we want them to be between the two nuclei. It's contributing to bonding. Okay? But sigma star means there's a node between the nuclei. And now the electrons are on the outside. They're taking away from bonding. The nuclei are being pulled apart. The bonding sigma orbital is lower in energy than the anti-bonding sigma star orbital, which is shown in this diagram 8.29 from the textbook. I have two s orbitals coming together, right? When they get combined, they either add to one another in phase, that contributes to bonding, or they subtract to one another when they're out of phase. And that star, that asterisk there, is an indication that you have an anti-bonding orbital. Okay. Bonding, the electrons are between the nuclei. Anti-bonding, they're outside. Okay. So in that previous slide, right, we had two different orbitals coming together, right? Two different colors. But it's just the spherical s orbital. Now we're going to jump and think about the p orbital next and keeping in mind that the p orbital is dumbbell shaped right and that it has two lobes of two different phases okay? which is what we see on the next slide and now when those phases come together again they can come together constructively which will contribute to bonding or destructively which will take away and be anti-bonding that's another way we can form a sigma or a sigma star okay? here we see the same phase coming together they added together at sigma, now sub p, because it came from a p orbital, specifically the px. When opposite colors come together, that takes away. It's called sigma star px. So those are two different ways we can form a sigma bond. The same type of thing can happen to form a pi bond in MO theory. Looking at p orbitals, remember they have to come together side to side to form a pi bond in VB or MO theory. And that can happen in phase or it can happen out of phase, which is shown right here. If the right phases, the right colors come together, that's lower energy contributing to bonding, but now it's called a pi P. Opposite colors come together, pi star. So know the different ways we can form sigma and pi bonds. But what we need to really be familiar with is how to show all that information on paper. And that comes in the form of a molecular orbital energy diagram, which is kind of a continuation of the atomic orbital diagrams from chapter six, but now we're putting two of them together. All right, we show energy levels of atomic and molecular orbitals from, right, because the MOs come from the atomic orbitals in this diagram. We show atomic orbitals on each side, the left and right molecular orbitals get shown in the middle and just like our atomic orbital energy diagrams in chapter six every line on a diagram represents an orbital that can hold two electrons but a key takeaway when you're making these is for each pair of atomic orbitals that come together right for every two that go in two come out one's bonding meaning it's lower in energy and one's anti-bonding meaning it's higher in energy then once we construct the diagram, we fill the electrons in according to the Aufbau principle from chapter six, lowest energy to highest energy from the bottom up. And however many electrons came from our atomic orbitals is how many electrons go into our molecular orbitals, keeping in mind that we're thinking about bonding, so we're only concerned with valence electrons. And this is what a molecular orbital energy diagram looks like. S orbitals came together. In phase, bonding, lower in energy, sigma. Out of phase, anti-bonding, higher in energy, sigma star. Same thing with the Ps, okay? Now there's six total, three over here and three over here that are coming together. So six go in, six come out. We get a sigma, we get two pi's, we get two pi stars, and all the way at the top, a sigma star. This is a general molecular orbital energy diagram. And then the dashed lines there are just showing where the orbitals originated from. And this diagram works for anything from the second period.
okay, the second row on the periodic table. Eight orbitals went in, eight atomic orbitals, and now eight molecular orbitals come out. And then I fill the electrons, however many I have. Right? We'll look at a couple specific energy diagrams next. One other thing this is useful for, once I fill the electrons into my MO diagram, is that I can track the electrons that are in bonding molecular orbitals and anti-bonding molecular orbitals, the one with the stars. Okay. That allows me to figure out for this diatomic molecule the overall bond order. How much of my electrons, how many of my electrons are contributing net to bonding? And I get that, it's known as bond order, by taking the number of bonding electrons, subtracting out the number of anti-bonding electrons, divided by two. A bond order of one means you have a single bond, two means you have a double bond, three means you have a triple bond, zero means no bond forms at all. And the higher the order, the stronger the bond. It's also possible that you can wind up having non-whole numbers, a bond order of like 1.5 or 2.5. And what that means okay, is that you have resonance. And that's why MO, molecular orbital theory, can explain resonance with just one diagram. This is what the MO diagram looks like for H2, diatomic hydrogen. Okay. Each hydrogen atom is 1s, 1. Okay. So we get a new lower energy bonding MO, a higher energy anti-bonding MO. But those two electrons that came in, both can fill the lower energy status which explains why diatomic hydrogen exists, right? Why it exists specifically as H2, because it's lower in energy. Okay. But if I were to switch over to diatomic helium, it's the same diagram, right? But both of those heliums that go in were 1s2 to start, meaning I have four electrons that go in and fill this diagram in the middle. Two down here, two on the top. So if I calculate the bond order, 2 minus 2 is equal to 0, divided by 2 still 0, no bond forms. And helium is not diatomic. It's happy to be on its own because okay? there's no net contribution to bonding. Okay. We can also look at the diagram for O2. Right Now with the p orbitals, it gets a little more complex right? because we've got the s and the p orbitals to consider. And sure enough, when we look at this filled diagram, oxygen, even though we don't show it in the Lewis structure, diatomic O2 has two unpaired electrons up here, according to MO theory, which is why it responds to an external magnetic field and oxygen is paramagnetic. So MO theory explains resonance and explains paramagnetism or diamagnetism with these diagrams. That's the key contribution of MO theory. Make sure you know that from this video. Know what paramagnetic and diamagnetic mean. And that concludes our information from Chapter 8.